Hello and welcome to Staying the Course, a podcast on navigating the challenges of lifelong learning. If you're new to the channel, do subscribe if you find this content helpful. Our guest for today is Emily Neo, an English teacher, tutor, and content advisor with a focus on secondary school education. Hello, Emily. How are you? Hello, Azrif. It's very nice to be here. I'm well, thanks, and hope you are too. Uh, yeah, it's really nice to be here. <laughs> Great. In this episode, I'll be speaking to Emily about growing her career as an educator. So upon graduating with a degree in biochemistry in 2017, Emily became a fellow in the Teach for Malaysia program to teach for two years. Since then, she has been in the education sector and seems to be growing further in the field. Emily holds a degree in biochemistry from Imperial College London, a diploma in education from Institute Pendidikan Guru, Campus Temenggong Ibrahim, and is currently pursuing a Master of Education at University Malaya. So Emily, can we begin? Yes. All right. Emily, my first question is a very short one. Tell us about yourself. Yeah, so I think Asif has managed to cover uh, a lot of what I've done professionally, but maybe to add in a bit more colour, my name is Emily and I am currently going into my fifth year as a high school English teacher. And in the private national school where I'm currently teaching, I teach from four and from five English. And when English for Science and Technology had used to be an SPM elective, I and before uh, this private, private education journey, I was in a government school where I taught from one, from two, from three English. So I've covered the whole spectrum of high school English, most of it from one to from five uh, in both uh, the public and private sectors. And that's my short teaching career so far. <laughs> Outside of teaching, I, I, you know, my hobbies are very typical for English teachers, reading, writing. <laughs> Great, great. Thank you, Emily, for, for sharing. Your career might uh, be relatively short, but I think you have made it a very enriching journey, which is why I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been inviting you to as a guest. So you graduated with an undergraduate degree in biochemistry uh, from Imperial. Um, and upon graduation, I was looking at your journey and you move straight into the education sector whereby in 2017, you became a fellow in the Teach for uh, Malaysia program. And then after that onwards, you stick, you've, you've been in the education sector. So what is your motivation that has led you to this journey? You graduated with something in the hard sciences, you shifted into teaching. What's the story behind that? I think this the answer to this question may well go way back to before my undergrad days. I was very, very lucky uh, when I was a school leaver to have been one of the top 50 SPM scorers in my batch. And because of this uh, small, but I thought it was quite meaningful at that time achievement, I, I managed to get a JPA national scholarship that covered my pre-university and undergraduate studies. And the significance of this on my family was, it was, it was huge because I still remember at the day my mom got that call from the GPA office, our whole family just couldn't sleep. We were, we were that excited. We were that over the moon because uh, it was just life-changing for us. We never thought about it. We never planned it. We never budgeted uh, for it that I would be able to pursue a, a degree, any degree at that time uh, under that, uh, under that uh, scholarship. Uh, it just took it, it was it took a huge financial burden off of mine and my family's uh, shoulders. But most importantly, I think that was that very concrete experience for me that showed just how life changing education can be for someone. I see. And yeah, I see. And uh, even as a teacher, right, you tend to want your students to have results. But it's not as straightforward as uh, even, you know, as myself as a student, I never really thought, oh, you would get, I would get 90 plus or get the 
the top ranking. Uh, it's really about the journey. It's about curating the, the journey. It's about uh, what processes, uh, how you can actually facilitate the process of learning for your students. Right. And I think that is what really fascinates me a lot about education. Yeah. So I sense that it was a personal um, motivation, right? Because you felt the power of education in opening doors for opportunity in paving ways uh, for individuals to maximize their potential. And it seems like you are trying to pay it forward, if you will, in a way, in, in becoming an educator, right? So what, what was the impetus for you to apply for TFM? Because uh, that was like immediately after graduation, right? Yeah, immediately. Uh, I think it was really the vision and the mission of the, the organization oh. so that one day all students will be able to get uh, access to higher quality education. I found uh, that throughout my short career, I'm very much drawn to uh, teams or, or organizations with very clear missions, visions, and in my current school, uh, they look at things like Malaysian hearts, global minds. And that to me is very attractive because I feel like there is something to be had from an international outlook or perspective. And at the same time, a uh, local experience and a very deep rooted understanding of your community, where you come from. And even in my own uh, undergrad and postgrad studies, which are a contrast of international and the local experience at UM, I yeah. feel like there is so much to be offered uh, regardless of where you go for your education, know your roots, you know, uh, open up your mind and contribute to, to the society that you're in. Mm. And you did your postgraduate diploma while you were serving as a fellow? Yes, indeed. So uh, we had to be trained as teachers. So, you know, not just any Tom, Dick and Harry can go and teach. You actually have to train for for this formal qualification. And this postgraduate diploma was specifically for those who already had an undergraduate degree, uh, people who might come from either languages or linguistics degree, but didn't have the teaching experience or even from other, other sorts of degrees. And I think that postgraduate diploma is what actually equipped us with the skill of uh, thinking how to design learning mm. for for young learners, yeah. I see. So if I graduate um, with a degree in math, for example, right? Mm. And then I don't want to go to industry. I have a drive to teach. So this is a sort of program that would then enable me to not only acquire the skill, but also the certification for me to legally practice as a teacher. Lah. So how was the format of the program, uh, Emily? Because you're like teaching as, I'm sorry, learning as you go, right? As you are yeah. already teaching, right? How, what is it like? Is it like online weekend classes or do you have to this do distance learning? How does it work? So it was, yeah, it was weekend classes. But I think maybe just to, 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 to share that uh, before we even went into schools, ah. there was a six-week intensive program ah. by Teach for Malaysia to oh. give you at least the basics so oh. that you don't go in blind and do whatever, you know. Okay. Uh, but the diploma actually exposed you to all the theories, all the models uh, of teaching and learning, whether it's uh, in educational psychology, in behavior management, or in your subject, TESOL, teaching English as a second language. Uh, by looking at theories and also considering how the different approaches you take in the classroom uh, hold up uh, depending on your context because you won't use the same strategy for different sets of learners. Mm. Uh, what it's done is actually it has helped you to become more reflective as a teacher. I so see. you are not just doing something because some researcher says you should do this. You are actually considering the evidence for that, looking at your situation, your environment, your classroom, and seeing how that fits. And I think that's where uh, educators who do maybe go on further and do their masters, they mm. would be able to critically assess research, look at whether uh, the, the samples that, 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 that they, they were working on or, or how they actually uh, claim their results, whether, whether it's through methodology or 
or how, how they analyze the data, whether it's robust enough, whether this is something that you, 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 you buy into and whether it's something that fits your context. Okay, so yeah. that's one dimension of it, Emily, which is uh, the pedagogical methods in, in teaching yeah. and, and, and transfer of learning and all of that, right? How about engaging with these kids, Emily? One of my biggest fears, I have two kids of my own, uh, is handling a, a room of uh, 30 students in a class, right? And you went straight into that domain um, with minimal exposure, I presume, from an undergraduate degree. How did you prepare yourself mentally on top of the training that you received uh, in the intensive course or during the diploma? Oh, I think uh, the real challenge is uh, that the it has to, when you say learner engagement, yeah, it's the motivation of the students to learn. How do you get uh, less motivated students to learn? How do you get um, students who might not see the value in learning English language to actually want to start speaking or even doing their work in English? I actually have students who came up to me and said, teacher, kenapa kita kena belajar bahasa Inggeris? Kenapa mereka tak boleh belajar bahasa, bahasa kita? And those are the things that you would tackle as a teacher. Uh, you would try to, I mean, the way you would approach it is such that you are not there as a teacher to fill in these empty vessels. Mm. These kids come with funds of knowledge. They have their own interests. They have their own uh, backgrounds, their own experiences, and to try and get them engaged with language learning, you engage those uh, funds of knowledge that they come to school with, whether it's their interest in K-pop or whether it's uh, TikTok. Yeah. Yeah, you try. Okay. And, and it does help, yeah. I try to do the same with, uh, with my kids, but I fail all the time, but um, I try. You know, the important thing is to try. <laughs> yeah, I don't succeed all the time as well. But What's yeah, that? yeah. Common well, we don't succeed all the time as well <laughs> as teachers. So yeah, keep trying. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, so you went to, to, to TFM and you were serving TFM for a while before you uh, continued to, to, to be a teacher. Um, and, you know, when I was looking at your uh, profile in your growth as an educator, you seem to also build a parallel journey of like an education journey in pursuing your MED, right? So um, what's the motivation there? Because it's not a requirement, right, for you to teach the MED. No, it's, no, it's not a requirement, right? So it's an advanced degree in education for practitioners. Um, what was the point that you felt like, I want to pursue an MED, I'm going to go to UM and, and, and until where you are now? To be very honest, uh, I never planned it, uh -huh. uh, but it was also the environment that I was in. This particular private national school that I'm in has a lot of uh, senior teachers and teachers who have their MED, whether it's in their field of study or in more general education uh, areas like educational psychology, educational leadership. Uh, some even had their PhDs before they came to teach there. And I think that had played a massive influence on, uh, I mean, it's just me looking at how they carry themselves, the knowledge that they had, chatting with them about the process of application, about what to look out for. I think that has helped me a lot with uh, seeing that it's feasible to do that master's as well as worthwhile. And I looked up to these people a lot. I see. So yeah. it was through observation and you were somehow inspired by them? Or was that the... Yeah, like a good influence in the staff room. Okay. So these were your colleagues. You were seeing your colleagues undertaking the program, is it? Undertaking or having already undertaken successfully. Ah. And yeah, so that, that was... It really. Okay, okay. And, and talk to us about this MED course. I've read some of it. Some of them are mostly coursework, I presume. Um, maybe there's some amount of research as well towards the end. How's the structure like? 
So yes, my MED is coursework based. Mm. Uh, we would have to go for all the classes uh, under the different strands of teaching English as a second language. And whether you're doing a class on reading and writing, literature, or uh, second language acquisition, you would have to do projects that relate very strongly to research because it's UM. UM is a research university. Uh -uh. Uh, they would throw you things like do a mini mini project, meaning a mini research end to end, chapters one to five uh, for this uh, for this one module. Or some people or some lecturers would ask you to uh, critically review ten uh, articles or write a literature review, write a proposal. Uh, a lot of that is ongoing as coursework, and that actually prepares you for the final stage where you have your research project. Uh, not that long. I think the, the, the cap is only like 18, 19,000 words. Uh, it is, but it is a proper research where you are not just replicating, you are actually opening up and uh, you, you're looking for the gaps in the literature and help, hopefully have some research that can stand in there. Yeah. Mm, okay. And it sounds like every MED has its own branches and yours is uh, English as a second language. May I know what are the other um, concentrations available under, at least at UM? Yeah, so I am in the languages and language education department, mm. uh, language and literacy education. So we have English and Bahasa. And we also have mathematics education, science education, uh, all sorts. Uh, the, those that under sports science as well, educational counseling. Yeah. Okay. How about education administration or education leadership? Is there such a focus area as well? Yes, there is. And one of my colleagues actually did her PhD in that, in that area. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Because, um, you know, I'm, I'm not in academia. I've dabbled in it a bit, but I've always been so fascinated by the community on campus. You know, so I'm still relatively an outsider. I do teach at some of the private universities. Um, I do advise on curriculum design and some of the programs, but I don't know. It's the overall vibe of the campus that really gets me going somehow, which is why perhaps I couldn't stop studying, finding excuses to go back to university, right? So Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so um, it sounds like uh, you can focus and narrow to a particular area that's really related to your uh, career, like yours as an English teacher, that you go into English. Yeah. English. How is the schedule like? Is it evening classes or is it... Uh, we can or some modules are online how does it work for part-time students like yourself uh so my classes would be in the evenings late afternoons and sometimes i would have to take uh non-paid leave from work i'm very lucky to be at a school where they've allowed that previously and uh, you know as a as a, as a full-time teacher you are also very you have to be responsible for your classes yeah so you know manage to switch over your switch over my classes to to be able to end before I even take that non-paid leave. So basically, I'm not, uh, my, my timetable is empty at the time. It just allows me to leave uh, campus to, to go and smoothly un uh, attend my classes. There's a lot of give and take where uh, it depends. Uh, you will have many, you know, you'll be spinning many plates as, as someone who is working full-time and studying uh, part-time. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's important to plan out your, your time, plan out what you're going to do on weekends and uh, really have a goal and keep those deadlines in sight, whether it's for work or for, for studies. And if you really need to, I think, you know, by, by showing that you are earnest, eager, your, your intention is in the right place, you ask for help, people will help. You need deadline extensions, you know, be sincere in your work. Uh, people will, will, will be willing to help you if mm. you need it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm gathering some pointers there in terms of time management. You're saying planning out, having a goal, setting a deadline and reaching out whenever you need to. Mm. One of the biggest worries of colleagues or friends or people who speak to me about studying part-time I've been I was calculating the other day it's been 10 years now since I first you know doing my did my degree at 
at uh, Imperial. So, so almost 10 years of studying part-time. One of their biggest worries is staying committed to the to the to the deadlines um and staying motivated as well yeah so how do you ensure that you stay motivated throughout the journey for you Emily at this I, I hear you mentioned goal just now so um, time management is one but the other one is also sustaining the motivation how do you sustain your motivation to persevere in this for me, my course and what I do at work is very much interlinked. Ah. So whatever you study, the next day you go to work, you see it play out in the classroom. And you get excited when you see these, uh, these connections being made. And uh, you, you somehow improve in your practice as well. And you are able to think uh, not just very, you, you won't think rigidly anymore. You think uh, creatively, you would think critically when you are planning out your lessons, implementing, or even after lessons, you're reflecting what went right, what went wrong. Actually, what went wrong didn't look, it, it isn't as bad uh, mm. because it, it, it tells you something uh, that and, and links to what you've, what you've just uh, studied. But I guess for some people who might have done a course that is very different from what they are working at, or maybe I can even reflect on my own experience going from biochem to to, to, to education, uh, sometimes you feel that disconnect. Uh, I guess I tried to find as many uh, connections as I could. Uh, coming from a natural science degree where you do a lot of research using scientific method, going to social science, people sometimes argue it's less scientific and whatnot, yeah. but you still have that, uh, you still find your data analysis, uh, some of the software that you used in, in, in back in uh, Imperial is still quite useful when you do your master's here. So I guess try and find those little connections and why you enjoy, you know, or why you even apply in the first place as mm. you go along the course. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's what I'm doing. My research yeah. is in mainly leadership development. My job is to design leadership development programs. So the interlink and you know the joy of part-time study is learning something tonight and going to work tomorrow and experimenting and seeing if you're yeah. putting theory to practice accordingly and it does um, excite you so i can i can i can uh, relate to that now content advisory and also mm -hmm. tutoring so you're a teacher you a student <laughs> And then you're also doing this content advisory and tutoring. Tutoring, I understand, but content advisory. So Emily, tell me what is that about? So basically, uh, one of the things, one of the projects that I work on after school is with this uh, nascent stage or early stage at that company where they are thinking of how to make English language learning more data-driven, more engaging. And my role there is to uh, sort of, you know how in ad tech, uh, they say there is nothing new under the sun in education, but sometimes people will sell you or even, you know, elite schools might sell you uh, new things, new trends, new horizons. And I guess my role there would be to make sure that whatever new things are actually grounded in, uh, in, in sound educational theory and sound educational practice, most importantly, because sometimes uh, theory and practice can have a disconnect mm. and and what's feasible uh, in the classroom and what people actually envision or dream of, may, there may be that disconnect and that actually uh, affects how something gets implemented or, or done, especially now with a lot of education reforms. But my role there is specifically for uh, using EdTech in language learning. Mm. So I always ask this question of late to people who are involved in EdTech. Um, mm. I spoke to a professor who was leading a micro-credentialing initiative in his institution. Uh, I spoke to another PhD candidate who is trying to drive, who, who was an early adopter of EdTech. So, mm. so my question to them is that now post in a post-COVID world, as we gradually recover, right? Um, there's an argument that's saying that we have gone through the biggest distance learning experiment ever. Um, people are more receptive of online learning. 
Um, there's also a school of thought that's saying that, you know, as much as online is appealing, um, the engagement of in-person physical classroom interaction is still craved for by the learners as well as the instructors as well. And personally, I feel like the future is hybrid or, or blended or what have you. So I think that's the future. But what is your view with regards to the future of um, teaching and learning as we move beyond COVID? I think uh, what happened with the COVID season was what they call emergency remote learning. So mm. no one was really prepared. No one was really planning for, for online learning. And like you say, yes, uh, I think... The, the, the successes or, or how emergency remote learning has been done has been uh, applauded, you know, commendable. Uh, but how do you actually harness technology intentionally to drive learning? Uh, I think it has, you have to put the education ahead of the technology. So technology would be your enabler and you would have, you still need uh, teachers or, or yeah, you still need that human touch. Education is actually what they call a very high touch industry, yeah. especially with our younger learners. Mm. Uh, yeah, so it's technology is not out there to replace uh, mm. or, or, or it's there to complement education rather. So I think that's, that's the right way to go about it. So talking about the future, Emily, mm -mm. you've been teaching for five years now. Right, you are pursuing an advanced degree, your MED, doing very, very well. <laughs> and how is the what is your vision? Where do you see yourself moving forward? Um, both in your career, uh, professional career, as well as your academic endeavor. Uh, what's your goal? What's your, what's your vision like? I think. Actually, I don't. Have, I feel like I'm quite a flexible person mm. on mm. on what the actual next steps are. Mm. But personally, professionally, I would love to keep uh, being in some way at the chalk face, uh, still teaching. And if I do ever get the chance to do something else and still make an impact, I think I would be very. I would still have that commitment to to teach, whether voluntarily or or somehow uh, be in touch with actual teaching. Uh, the, the big vision for me, I think, is always to work with teams with good, uh, good culture, mm. uh, strong vision, strong mission, high-performing teams. I think that is what the, that's roughly what I'm committed to. Yeah. And yeah, it, it will actually drive your, your learning further. It gives you more opportunities. And it's sometimes good to be the numbers in the room which is what I feel when I do my content advisory work, working with data scientists and whatnot. Mm. Uh, I think that is, that is the sort of situations that I want to put myself in or the kinds of schools that I would like to be in, uh, just as I ha have, you know, encountered colleagues who have done your PhDs and whatnot and felt like, wow, I think those are, that, that's roughly the, 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 the goal for, for me. Yeah. Right, right. And, and as we were, Talking before we, we recorded earlier, um, I am really impressed with the way that you are sharing knowledge to the public because some people just put up a link, some people, you know, just put on your opinion, but I think you are curating your ideas very thoughtfully and very with, with a very uh, well thought out structure so that the way that the content is being consumed is also you make it easy for people to access your content. Now, my question is, uh, what drives you and what's the motivation behind sharing um, your knowledge, at least where I'm seeing now on, on LinkedIn? I don't know where else, if you, if you are uh, building a YouTube channel or you do it in, on, on Twitter as well, on Instagram. So, but I'm seeing it mostly on LinkedIn. Uh, so I think that's a form of content creation as well, but more importantly, it's not spreading the knowledge, right? What's the motivation there and what is your, not strategy, what is your um, intent, objective in doing it? So uh, what actually spurred me to start posting all those what we call atomic essays yeah. on LinkedIn was uh, I actually joined uh, this cohort-based course called Ship 30 for 30. I think it's, uh, the creators are based in the US, but 
whatever the, the, the cohorts international, uh, they do teach you how to write digitally well okay. and taken some of those strategies. And what's what, what, what drives me to do that is as a teacher, uh, seeing a lot of discourse around education coming from, I wouldn't say unqualified, but these are different stakeholders, the parents, uh, the uh -huh. public, okay. different people are giving their opinions on education, teachers as well. But perhaps there would it would be good if uh, more teachers or, or that we, uh, not to say a more coherent, but there were teacher voices represented in a lot of that I discourse see. on what's actually going right with education because we hear a lot of what's going wrong or what's driving the decisions that are being made in education or what's driving the reforms. What are the shortcomings really? Uh, you know, people always say, oh, our English teachers do not have that level of proficiency. But, you know, in education, uh, it's always about learning from the more knowledgeable other in your zone of proximal development. So it could just be somebody one step ahead of you rather than like 10 steps. Uh, so you just need to be, you know, sometimes those students with very, very uh, poor grasp of, it, of language might benefit fr uh, from from someone who's just one level higher than, you know, maybe the professor of linguistics somewhere. Mm. And yeah, those kind of things, those kinds of, I wouldn't say misconceptions, but uh, I think people need to have a better understanding or, you know, that there needs to be uh, more sound voices out there in that discourse on education, which is a very public discourse. I understand. I fully understand. <laughs> um, do you put it out on Facebook as well? Or just oh, one. I yeah. So LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and TypeShare, which is uh, oh, really a, convenient okay. to use. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Digital writing tool. Yeah, because I just thinking, I was just thinking, like, if you want to sort of balance the views out there, Facebook is a great place that really need that, need that balance. That's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Actually, you should yeah. think of going there. Uh, although, although LinkedIn is also, um, I I also see that you know imbalanced views quite prevalent on, on LinkedIn as well. Right. Now, you mentioned earlier about wanting to work in an environment where the culture is encouraging uh, clarity in vision and mission. Um, you know, sort of like feeding off each other's energy, right, in, the, in, that, in that team situation. Um, being an educator, being a teacher, what makes this is my second last question what makes an effective educator in your opinion what are the traits of an effective um educator i'm not going to say successful because that's a very subjective matter but effective educator so i think i think i mentioned that uh the the, the educator the more knowledgeable other just needs to be that one step ahead of the students so if you are 10 steps ahead highly proficient uh, good, you have that subject matter expertise, but what's most important is that you know the steps one to 10 to reach uh, to that intended or desired, highly desired uh, level that you want your students to get to. Knowing how to sequence your learning, knowing how to scaffold, break down, and provide good models for your students, whether it's in the subject or even in character development. Uh, I feel like the job of an educator never really stops, mm. uh, not just because you bring back marking and whatnot, but you, you, you don't just work as an educator, you are an educator and uh, it's, yeah, I mean, being consistent with, um, with uh, who you are and how you, uh, you know, what, what's right, what's not right. Having high integrity is very important as an mm. educator. Yeah. So before I go to my last question, I would mm -hmm. just like to recap on three big points that I gather from this insightful conversation with you. Uh, because the topic of our conversation is building a career in teaching, right? I think mm -hmm. from your sharing of how you began going into teaching as well as um, the way that you were taking inspiration from your colleague, from the Bilik Guru. You know? I felt like um, the value of engaging interpersonal connection with the student as well as with the clique, in other words, with the community within the school compound, is highly important in becoming an effective 
um, uh, in, in building a career in teaching. So that's number one, engaging and getting inspiration. Number two, we spoke about your uh, MED experience in doing it part-time while still working. You mentioned earlier there's a lot of give and take there, right? Um, and for people um, who are juggling work, family, and, and, and school, uh, there's, 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 there's uh, the significance of planning out, having clear goals on how do you get over on the deadlines and reaching out when you need help. Yeah, so I think give and take is the second point. And I think the third question that I asked you was on the staying motivated across the, the uh, journey. And you talked about the linkages between study and work. And that keeps you going. Yeah, so, yeah. so engaging and inspira getting inspiration, give and take, and also converging work and study, if you will, right? So, my last question, Emily. Um, sometimes I speak to my, my daughter's uh, uh, friends. I ask them what they want to be when they grow up. And they say they want to become a teacher. Um, when you were in school, I'm sure you've had friends who said they want to become a teacher. And, um, and I've, I, I told you earlier, I'm, I've been fascinated with the teaching career as well. So, Emily, I'm sure there are many out there, um, young ones who are aspiring to follow your footsteps into going into the building a career in, in, in teaching and uh, pursuing um, going deeper into the um, academic side of, 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 of education as well. What would be your words of advice uh, for them to hold on to if they were to follow your footsteps? I think first and foremost, I think the, the the bit about being a teacher. Yes, you train to be a teacher, to teach young learners, but at the same time, anyone, like even yourself, you're working teaching and learning development. Mm. Uh, you could be a teacher or an educator in any capacity uh, that you're in, whether you're an engineer, you are teaching your juniors or mentoring your juniors, or a doctor, mentoring the housemen, etc. So you could be a teacher in any of these capacities. Make sure that whatever you want to do is aligned to what you are actually interested in. But if you do want to become like a, a trained, qualified teacher and to devote, you know, the, 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 the years of study and practical and whatnot to become one, uh, go and test it out in the sense that uh, there are opportunities for Guru Ganti in, in government schools where sometimes Form 6 students actually come in and uh, they, they take over like three months of a teacher on maternity leave, etc., or even just teach your cousins, your family members who are younger than you, see if you like it, see if you have an aptitude for working with uh, younger students. You may not be able to, you know, very successfully uh, sequence lessons, plan lessons, mark work, but at least see if that, if, if it's interesting to you, and if you actually find that it's something joyful to do. And for me personally, even when I was doing my undergrad at Imperial, they had this scheme called this peer assisted learning uh, support. I signed up for it and I ended up running like weekly. Uh, it's not a tutorial, but like support sessions for uh, first year students mm. and just running through assignments or anything that study tips, see if you like those kind of things, uh, volunteer for tutoring and yeah, before you commit go and have a, you know, have a feel for whether it's uh, something for you, but otherwise, in whatever line you do, you definitely have to teach someone. This is also very important um, because, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm still in the corporate sector, right? Um, the narrative today is about building leaders as coaches and coaching mm -hmm. in a way at the workplace is a form of teaching as well. Um, mm. You mentioned Guru Ganti earlier, right? You know, whenever there's an opportunity for um, the staff in my organization to go into teach weekend schools, you see many hands get raised because deep inside, they do still wanna wanna go and teach. And I think you know the example that you gave of teaching cousins, that was the birth of Khan Academy, because. Yes. I think he he began teaching uh, his cousin math over Yahoo Messenger. I think some time ago, right? So uh, you'll never know, right? 
on the capacity that you have in teaching. So, Emily, this has been this has been a great conversation. Um, as I said earlier, I invited you because I think you are a testament on uh, somebody who is really uh, demonstrating keenness to learn uh, while being an educator herself. Yeah. So I'm so confident that your story would be an inspiration to many. Yeah, Emily. And my best wishes to you in your vision and your goals. Thank you so much, Athrib. It was a pleasure speaking to you and I, I'm just very honoured to be here. Thank you and take care. You too. Thanks a lot, Emily. Bye-bye.